My sister-in-law abandoned her kids for a shopping spree. Now Seps is involved and she's furious with O. My mother was paralyzed from the waist down and had always been suffering from several health issues since the time I can remember. Her condition required constant care and attention, which placed a significant burden on our family. My father worked as a truck driver, so he was often gone for long hours, sometimes even days. Dad and I did everything we could to ensure mom was comfortable and well cared for. However, his job's demanding nature meant that I had to shoulder a lot of the caregiving duties on my own. We had a nurse who would come to help out occasionally, but it wasn't often enough. We simply didn't have the financial means to hire a full-time caregiver. The times when the nurse was there felt like a relief, but those moments were rare. This left me with the responsibility of taking care of my mom for the majority of the time. Every day after school, I would come home and immediately tend to my mom's needs. Whether it was helping her with her physical therapy exercises, preparing her meals, helping her to relieve herself in the washroom, or just keeping her company, it was a full-time job in itself. There were so many days when I was exhausted and felt like I was missing out on my teenage years. While my friends were out having fun, I was at home ensuring mom was okay. She was very neat and would not even let me leave her room to watch TV or do my homework. I would have to sit right next to her in bed while finishing up my assignments so she could feel like was helping me out in some ways. As you can imagine, by the time I graduated high school, I was utterly exhausted to be at home. The years of balancing schoolwork, caregiving, and trying to maintain some semblance of a social life had taken their toll. I loved my mom dearly and never resented her, but the constant responsibility weighed heavily on me. I was drained physically, emotionally, and mentally. Despite the exhaustion, I knew I had done everything I could to make her life as comfortable as possible given our circumstances. When it was time for me to choose a college, I deliberately picked the university that was the farthest from home. I knew that if I chose a closer school, I would be drawn back home every weekend to take care of mom. I felt a profound sense of guilt about my decision, but I also recognized that I needed to prioritize my own survival and mental health. The years of caregiving had left me drained, and I needed a chance to recover and live my own life. My parents were not happy with my choice. My dad, in particular, insisted that I drop out of the university and take a gap year. He wanted me to apply to universities nearby so that I could continue to help take care of mom. Meanwhile, mom kept telling me that I could never live without her and that I was abandoning my family in their time of need. I argued back, saying that I had spent my entire life living under their rules and taking on responsibilities that were not typical for someone my age. I told them that it was time for me to get out and live my own life. My dad threatened to cut me off financially if I didn't listen to him. In a moment of anger and frustration, I told him that it was time for him to step up and take care of his wife instead of expecting a child half his age to shoulder the burden. My parents were furious and made their indignation clear. Mom cried for days, pleading with me to reconsider my decision. Up until the day I had to move out, she kept begging me to stay. Her tearful pleas and my dad's stern disapproval weighed heavily on my heart. But I stood my ground, knowing that if I didn't take this step, I would never be able to live my own life or heal from the years of emotional and physical exhaustion. It was one of the hardest decisions I ever had to make, but I knew it was necessary for my own well-being. When I finally moved into my college dorm, it felt surreal. I couldn't believe that I was finally free from the responsibilities that had defined my life for so long. The dorm room, with its simple bed, desk, and closet, symbolized a new chapter. I was overwhelmed with a mix of emotions, relief, excitement, and a touch of sadness for leaving my family behind. During college, I tried my best to stay in touch with my parents. My dad, however, always resented me for leaving. So our conversations were often strained, filled with underlying tension and unspoken accusations. So he can understand my need to get away, and he held on to his bitterness. My mom, on the other hand, missed me terribly. And over time, she began to understand that I had no choice but to leave. She realized that I needed this break for my own well-being. Because I had to take care of my mom from such a young age, I made the decision quite early on in my life that I never wanted to have children and my mind has never changed. My entire childhood and teenage years were spent taking care of an adult, and I felt that I didn't have the mental and emotional capacity left in me to take care of anyone else in the future. I was always clear about this choice with every guy I have ever met. For a long time, I chose to remain single rather than date men who, despite knowing my decision to remain child-free, would hope that I would eventually change my mind. So when I didn't change my mind, they would get angry, saying how women were supposed to have children and that it was ungodly of me to deny them. So their reactions reinforced my decision to stay single. I refused to let them pressure me into a life I didn't want, and I was determined to find someone who would accept me for who I was, without the expectation of motherhood. This is why when I finally met James, who didn't want children just like me and instead wanted to travel the world, it felt like a match made in heaven. From the moment we started talking, I knew he was different. James shared my passion for travel and exploration, and also my firm decision not to have children. He told me that he had undergone a vasectomy a long time ago because he was sure he never wanted to be a father. It was such a relief to find someone who was on the same page as me. 
Besides our shared interest in remaining child-free, James was kind, helpful, and intelligent. His spontaneity matched mine perfectly, and together we could just up and travel anywhere we wished. With James, I've been to over 20 different countries. Our adventures have taken us from the bustling streets of Tokyo to the serene beaches of Greece, and each journey has been an incredible experience. Now, don't get me wrong, we are not rich, and neither do we come from wealthy families. However, because we don't have children and both of us are adaptable adults, we have been able to keep our priorities straight. We prioritize experiences over material possessions, and we live frugally when necessary to save up for our next trip. Our love for travel and our commitment to living a child-free life have brought us closer together. It's a partnership based on mutual understanding and shared dreams, and it has made our life together incredibly fulfilling. Everything with James is great, but I can't say the same about his family. Early on, James warned me that his mother and sister are very difficult to get along with. He shared multiple stories about how these two women have always judged every girl he has ever dated, never really approving of them. Over the years, his family has been consistently judgmental and always had an opinion about his lifestyle. James enjoys being a free spirit, embracing spontaneity and adventure, but his family has always wanted him to settle down and have a traditional job. This clash of values has been a significant source of tension between them. The situation escalated dramatically back when James decided to get a vasectomy. His mother, Vinny, was furious when she found out. She was so angry that she stormed into his workplace and yelled at him in front of everyone, expressing her shame and disappointment that he did not want to become a father. She told him she was ashamed to have given birth to a son like him. That incident was a turning point for James. The public humiliation and the lack of respect for his personal choices made him realize that he needed to distance himself from his family. Since then, he has reduced his contact with them as much as possible. While he still loves his family, he understands that their constant judgment and disapproval are toxic to his well-being. James's decision to minimize contact has allowed him to live his life more freely, but it also means that there is an undercurrent of tension whenever family matters arise. James's mother did apologize to him several times after the vasectomy incident, which is why, eventually, he agreed to let me meet her. I was quite well prepared for the encounter, having grown up with pushy parents myself. James's mother, Vinny, was exactly as I had imagined short-tempered and very mouthy. In our first meeting, she immediately had opinions to share about my red hair color and the tattoo on my forearm. She didn't hold back her judgments, making it clear that she wasn't impressed. When she asked about my parents, I told her about my mother's disability. Vinny then made a shocking comment, asking if that was why I wanted to marry James so he could help me take care of my mom. I was taken aback, especially since James hadn't even met my mother at that point. Besides, why would I need to marry a man to take care of my mom? Her ridiculous words made me laugh out loud. Vinny didn't like that at all and said she found my laughter very insulting. I didn't care and just kept eating my food without apologizing to her. Over the years, our relationship has never improved, but I've never sweated about it. I let her do her thing, and I do mine. Her opinions and judgments don't affect me, and I maintain a polite but distant relationship with her. However, the main villain in my life isn't my mother-in-law. Since I can pretty much handle her, it's actually my sister-in-law. She has always hated the fact that I don't want children as much as James. She had always expected her brother to meet a woman who would eventually change his mind and force him into becoming a father. Instead, James met me, who shared his interest in not having kids, and this infuriated her. When she found out that we both wanted to remain child-free, she asked me what the purpose of my life was. I told her that my purpose was to live my life just like every other person, doing the things I wanted to do. However, she argued, questioning the point of God giving me a uterus as if the sole purpose of a woman is to become a breeding animal. I responded that just because one has a uterus doesn't mean they have to use it and that people who don't want to have children shouldn't be forced to take on kids they can't manage. Nothing would damage a kid more than having parents who don't know how to take care of them. Despite my explanation, Sal just shook her head and kept telling me how James and I were going to regret our decision when we were older and had no one to take care of us. I quipped back that I didn't want to have children just to have insurance for them to take care of me, as there's no guarantee they ever would. I also mentioned that I would feel much more comfortable at an old-age home, with nurses and staff who could take care of me, if such a situation ever arose when we were older. Sile never bothered listening to me as you can already imagine. Over the years, she has done everything in her power to force us to change our minds. It all started with her having children, and then calling us every other weekend to take care of them. Now, James and I love our nephews and niece, but spending time with them for three to four hours isn't going to change our minds about not wanting kids. Currently, James and I are working hard to build our marketing agency. Even though it has just started, we've already onboarded a few well-paying clients. This time is crucial for us, and we know we have to work very hard to retain them for a long time. At this stage, we also rely heavily on word of mouth from these clients to spread the word that we're a good agency for their brands. Because of this, James and I have been very busy with work and haven't even traveled anywhere. Sal is well aware of this, however, without ever checking in on us, she will just drop her kids off at our place unannounced. 
She will give us excuses that she needs a break or has to buy groceries but will be gone for hours on end. Whenever this happens, James tries to take care of the kids for about an hour before he gets quickly irritated. He then ends up stump switching on the TV for them and lets them watch whatever they want to. Kids being kids get quickly bored and want attention, so then they start wailing or fighting among themselves, which is when I am forced to leave my work and play with them. I know they're just kids, but due to all this, I've started to resent them, and I know for a fact that James does too. This situation is frustrating because we are trying to build something important, and every interruption feels like a step backward from our future. Despite my best efforts to maintain a good relationship with my style, her constant disregard for our time and work commitments is creating a significant strain. We have had several talks with her, but she just dismisses our feelings, saying her kids are practically related to us by blood and that we should learn to live with them. This is why for the past two months, James and I have been escaping to cafes to work, just to avoid his sister's unannounced child drop-offs. Whenever she would show up at our place, we'd tell her we were out meeting a client or had an important meeting that day. This way, we knew she couldn't leave the kids with us any longer. And of course, my style would get furious that we were unavailable and would demand we come back home. But James would argue back, insisting she needed to watch over her own kids instead of pushing them onto us all the time. So later, my mill would call James to reprimand him about not helping his sister enough and how difficult it is for her to be a parent of three. I would encourage James to tell her that if she cared so much about Syl, then she should start taking care of the children herself. So this would infuriate Mill even more, as she'd then make excuses about being too old and having done more than enough. She would then continue to insist that we were young and needed to be around children. While we respected her perspective, we couldn't compromise on our priorities. The CAF has provided us with a sanctuary where we could concentrate on client meetings, strategy sessions, and creative work without the unexpected disruptions that came with Sile's unannounced visits. This strategy has been working well for us for quite some time, and while it hasn't resolved the underlying family tensions, it's given us the space we need to prioritize our work and maintain our sanity. Recently, my mother succumbed to her ongoing illness. When my dad called to deliver the news, I was devastated and completely shattered. Despite the distance that had grown between me and my parents over the years, I still loved my mother deeply and the realization that she was no longer with us was incredibly painful. James and I immediately booked a car to drive back home, a journey that would typically take three to four hours depending on traffic. However, just as we were on our way, Syl called James. She informed him that she was exhausted and needed a mental break, asking him to take care of her kids. James explained to her about my mother's passing and expressed his inability to help at that moment. He assured her that after we returned from the funeral, he would be available to watch over the kids so she could have her break. But Sale's response shocked us both. She had the audacity to suggest that we take her kids with us to the funeral. She thought it would be a good idea for them to enjoy a long drive and spend a few days with us. I could hear every word she said because James had her on speakerphone in the car. I was baffled by her insensitivity and rolled my eyes. This was my mother's funeral for God's sake, not a joyous trip to Disneyland. Her kids had never even met my mom, and the thought of bringing them to an event where people would be grieving was completely inappropriate and disrespectful to everyone, including me. Sile didn't even bother to ask James about me or about how I was doing yet wanted us to just take her kids off her hands. James again declined her and told her that he was driving so he would have to call her back later. During my mom's funeral, I received only a couple of texts from my mother-in-law and sister-in-law offering their condolences. I didn't hear from them over the phone, but I wasn't too bothered at the time, because my focus was entirely on honoring my mom's memory and supporting my family through this tough period. So on the day of the burial, James started receiving numerous missed calls from his mother, which he chose not to answer. Since I had left my phone at home, I couldn't be sure if they had tried to reach out to me as well. When we returned home after the funeral in the afternoon, I was surprised to find several voicemails waiting for me from Sill and Mill. I initially thought they were reaching out to express sympathy for my mother's passing, but to my surprise, there were multiple voicemails demanding that James and I come back immediately to watch over the kids. They explained they wanted to go on a shopping spree, which left me taken aback and hurt as I listened to voicemail after voicemail from both of them, insisting on our return. James heard the messages too and immediately called his sister to confront her about their inappropriate demands. So like me, he was starting to get really frustrated with their insensitivity and selfishness during such a difficult time. We found it incredibly insensitive that they were more concerned about their own plans than understanding the emotional toll losing my mom had on me and James. However, when James finally got in touch with his sister, she informed us that she was already with Mill on the road and they had left her kids at home. She insisted that we needed to drive back to her place immediately, as it had already been 30 minutes since they had left after sending us the last voicemail. James incredulously questioned if she had in fact lost her mind, 
since we had just come back from burying my mother, and there was no way we could drive to her place at the moment. Hearing this, in the background, Mill started to yell at him, accusing him of only prioritizing his wife and having no problem driving with me to my mom's funeral. She said he should also prioritize his family and have no issue driving back immediately and taking care of his nephews and niece. James pointed out how they could not just force us to drop everything for the kids, especially when we were still in mourning. However, Sile defended herself, stating that she had left the TV on and provided enough food for the children so we didn't have to do much for them. But she insisted that we needed to return home as soon as possible because the kids would get hungry soon. My eyes widened in shock as I started to realize that she sounded quite serious. As a result, my husband and I decided to drive to her home, even though we were exhausted. We called Sile several times throughout our drive, but she let our calls go to voicemail each time. We kept hoping and praying that she was probably pranking us and that she would not actually abandon her own children. When we finally arrived, at her place, our worst fears were tragically confirmed. So we entered her living room to find all her three kids in a state of distress, hungry, crying, and visibly shaken. The sight of their tear-streaked faces and desperate cries tore at our hearts. It was clear they had been left alone for far too long and looked very relieved to see us there. Immediately, we rushed to comfort them, providing food and soothing words as we assessed the situation. Guilt and anger surged within us. How could Sile have been so reckless, so indifferent to her own children's well-being? However, to our further horror, we discovered James' niece in distress as she had half a crayon stuck in her nose. She was apparently playing around with crayons and was now struggling to breathe properly. We had no idea how long she had the crayon up in her nose, so we immediately dialed 911, explaining the urgent situation. We also had to explain how Sale had abandoned her children leading to their critical condition since we didn't want to be implicated in this incident. The ambulance and police arrived swiftly and we recounted the events. So we informed them about how we were at my mother's funeral and then had to rush back home after Sale had already left the eventually sinking divide. And by then, we knew this was a serious matter. So later, when Sale and Mill arrived, seemingly oblivious to the severity of the situation, carrying multiple shopping bags, they were shocked to see police and spare some Kessnell speaking with us. Sile erupted in anger, accusing us of betraying her and end up attempting to harm the custody rights of her children. She tried to explain how she had left the kids at the safety of her home and that she knew me and my husband would drive back home immediately so her kids were never actually in any real danger. Fortunately, CFs and the police didn't agree with her. Following these events, Sile has been arrested for abandonment and the children have been put under our care temporarily since their father lives in another country and will take some time to fly back home. Mill is furious at James and me for involving the authorities and has threatened legal action against us. According to her, we have mentally harassed and endangered her daughter by getting her arrested for no reason as this could lead to Sile losing custody rights permanently. Are we the assholes for reporting Sile and possibly ruining her life? Update 1 okay, so instead of repeating myself in the comments, I'm going to clear up a few things here. James' father passed away when he was quite young. This is why Mill and Sale have always been so involved in his life as they both feel they have practically raised him together. Obviously, that's not true because according to James, his mother and sister used to abandon him as a child all the time to do their own thing so he learned to pretty much take care of himself all on his own. This is also the number one reason why he has never wanted to have kids after watching his mother be such a terrible parent to him and his sister. My husband does stand up to them all the time but they just refuse to take no for an answer. Sile and her ex-husband are divorced. Her ex currently lives in another country for his job, but he is flying back soon to take on the responsibility of the kids. He does pay child support every month as well as had to pay a hefty alimony during his divorce, which is how Sal can afford to live a lavish lifestyle without a job. Since the court generally lets mothers have full, primary custody of the children, they have been living with Sale as a result and the father comes and visits the kids every other month. I don't think he had any idea that his wife would regularly abandon their kids at our place because we have never talked to him but we are planning to have a sit down with him when he arrives and let him know everything that has been going on. As of now, the kids are doing okay with us. They don't look traumatized and we are doing our best to take care of them as much as we can. Unfortunately, James and I don't think we can take care of the children permanently in the future. We are not equipped to take on this responsibility and we are grateful that their father will be arriving soon. Yes, Mel is still threatening to take us to court, however, after reading all your comments, I feel much better knowing that she doesn't really have any legal grounds to stand on. As usual, she is just probably trying to intimidate us and refusing to accept her own role in encouraging Sile to abandon her kids that day. Update 2. So Sile's been released on bail currently thanks to her lawyer. However, this arrest is going to seriously affect her upcoming custodial fight with her ex-husband. Her ex did come to meet me and James. He thanked us for everything and told us that he had no idea about how Sale had been treating their kids. He assured us that he would take his kids away from Sale, no matter what, to prevent them from ever suffering again. The ex seems quite well off, so I'm sure he can hire nannies to care for the children at his place. 
which is a far better option than what Syl does. The only thing Syl won't like about this arrangement is losing child support, which she depends on to maintain her lifestyle. We have blocked Mel after sending her a long text message in which we firmly express that we wanted nothing to do with her whatsoever and that she shares 100% responsibility with Syl for abandoning the kids in that state. We further informed her that we were done with her narcissistic behavior, and if she ever approached us again, we wouldn't hesitate to get a restraining order against her. We are hoping this makes her stop contacting us ever again in the future. Update 3 I know it's been several months since I last updated, but I wanted to come here and give a final update about Sill. It turns out that she lost custody, and the judge rightfully let the father take full custody of the children. Sile's neglect and abandonment of the kids were crucial factors in the court's decision. During the custody battle, several witnesses, including us, testified about the conditions we found the children in and Sel's irresponsible behavior. I also testified about the multiple times Sel would drop off her kids at our place and practically force us to take care of them. So in the end, the judge deemed it in the best interest of the children to be under their father's care, given his stable situation and commitment to providing a safe and nurturing environment. On the day of the court ruling, Sil told me and James that we had no right to involve the authorities and that all we had to do was keep our mouths shut and take her children to the hospital if one of them needed any medical attention. She called me several insulting words and accused me of being jealous of her. James told her that this was probably the last time we would ever be in the same room together and threatened to take legal action against her just like Jessica were to say morning to Mel. Fortunately, over the past few months, the children have become adjusted well to their new living arrangements with their father. They are finally surrounded by the love and support they deserve. We video call the kids every weekend. James and I are very relieved that they are now in a stable and caring environment, free from the neglect they experienced before. As for everyone asking about my dad, he's doing okay. Since my mother's passing, I've been reconnecting with him more often. It's been a process of healing and rebuilding our relationship during this difficult time, 